true and living God. And Father, I pray today, as we remember our veterans, we never forget you because it is so easy to be distracted by the issues of the world. But Lord, you, you are king and we are not. And we celebrate our veterans and we celebrate you because you are worthy of our praise. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Well, everyone, I am so glad that you are here today. Veterans Day is exciting. As we think about our vets all week this week, and we've been pondering all the sacrifices that they've made, and I'm telling you what, what they have to put up with now is craziness, is not? It is. It's craziness. And so I just want to take a minute to do something that I truly feel is necessary. I, I feel obligated to salute you veterans who have endured the last 20 years in Afghanistan and Iraq, and I am sorry that it has ended the way it has, and I want to apologize as a citizen of this great country for the sacrifice that you did over there. Let's give those guys a hand. I want you to know that your sacrifice was not in vain. The many, 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 many tours of duty that you did countlessly People did up to four and five tours, maybe even more over there. And for it to end the way it did is a shame. It's an embarrassment to me, and I'm sure it is an embarrassment to most of you. But we need to make sure that we honor and recognize that those that were over there that were separated from their families, spent years and years away from their children, uh, on our behalf, we need to celebrate their sacrifice and never, ever, ever, ever forget. Also, we just want to continue to remind you that at morning, that every morning on Sunday morning at 930, we meet for community groups because we believe circles are better than rows. We want you to get involved. We want you to get plugged in and we want to make a difference in your life and your family's life because we want to, we want to help you raise the next generation to be world changers. Okay, world changers, we have a big vision. We think every child that is out here, if you're a child in the house, I want you to know you're a world changer. Actually, I should say that. A child, that means every, everybody's a child, right? Yeah. They, <laughs> that's right. You 80-year-olds are thinking, I'm not a child. Yes, you are. You're a child of somebody. And we believe in world changing. Okay, that's what we're all about here. We would love for you guys to be back there with us. Also, don't forget this, that on Wednesday nights, we do meet. Uh, we have small groups. We, we have church on Wednesday nights. We have a lot of activities going on for kids through Awana. We would love for you to be part of all of that. Well, well, well. Also, Thanksgiving's coming up. Everybody love the turkey? How many? Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. I know this is on television. I, please don't be embarrassed. How many of you guys like ham during Thanksgiving? Wow. How many people love turkey? All right, there's a new group out there. I'm going for this. How many like ribeyes? I'm just saying, prime rib might be a better option. I, I like to give those turkeys a break every once in a while. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, we are excited about Thanksgiving on November 20th. Okay, on November 20th, on Saturday, don't forget, we are making 350 boxes to give away to homeless people and who you say who are these homeless people we're going to be doing a little different this year we're giving uh, we're going to be giving to kids who are in transition we're going to be helping ocs families we're going to be working with our bus families also with those even in our church who are a little less fortunate we're going to be giving out boxes so what we're doing on that morning at 10 o'clock we're going to be coming into the multi-purpose gym we'll be making the boxes and then we'll be delivering those to uh, people around the city you'll want to be a part of that and uh, it's an exciting time for your family. Now listen, we also are doing on the 20th, we're serving at the Sullivan Arena. And of course, those that event can only be 18 years and older. There's limited space. So please email events at abt.church so that you can sign up to be part of that. Again, events at abt.church. We got to take at least about 75 people down there. We'll be passing out clothing. We'll be feeding, feeding them down there. We'll be celebrating uh, our Jesus, our Lord, the love of God to them. I love, if you're all ready to share the gospel, you want to sign up, okay? We want to be down there really trying to help out those men that are down there. It'll be some men and some ladies. Well, with that said, we had a busy week. 
OCC has been doing packing parties. We did one on Wednesday night with our Awana kids, and then we did one on Sunday afternoon. We did over 800. Those guys are rock stars. They did over 800, and I got the number right here, 824 boxes in one week. That is awesome, okay? So let's watch this video and see what our OCC boxes are all about. Because the doesn't receive their boxes. Have you ever thought what comes after the box? At Samaritan's Purse, we've got an incredible program after Operation Christmas Child. It's called The Greatest Journey. The purpose of Samaritan's Purse is evangelism. We just don't want to just hand out a box. Children that put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we want them to grow in their faith. We want to disciple them and raise up an army of young kids who can take their faith and share it with another child so that that person will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. This is what it's all about, evangelism, taking the gospel to another generation. You shall love the Lord your God. You know that you're passing on what you've learned to another person, not just keeping the knowledge for yourself. You feel love, you feel like, you know what, I'm at home. I'm doing what I'm supposed to do right now. We always work through the local church. And when it's all said and done and the training's finished, these kids are gonna be part of the church, going out into their communities, sharing their faith in Jesus Christ. The Greatest Journey is a great opportunity to impact the life of a child, teaching children how to share their faith with their friends and family around the world, raising up an army of evangelists who can take the gospel to the next generation. Amen. Franklin and his team, this is what we're all about, reaching the next generation. I love the fact that those Christmas boxes just don't go on deaf ears. They're all into the gospel. They're trying to train kids in the next generation to be the next warrior soul winners in our world. Ushers, if you would get ready to come forward, we're about to take up the offering, but I have one more announcement while they're coming up. The Christmas Spectacular is on its way. How many of you guys, before Thanksgiving, how many of you guys have put your tree up? Yeah, I am halfway up, just so you know. My life is a little busy, so my wife and I were like, let's do the Christmas tree tonight. We started building it, and before you know it, we got halfway done, got tired, got distracted, had to go to some meeting, and before you know it, I still have a half-built tree in my house. It's kind of awkward, and it's uh, one of those sores for men, you know, because just so you know, the men are the light people. Did you know that? that that's, that's my job. My job is lights. The problem is my wife wants 10,000 lights on a tree. And so if there's one dark spot on the tree, it's not good enough. And so I had to go out and we ran out of lights because we had like, you know, 45 rows on there already and there wasn't enough. So we had to buy 15 more boxes of lights so we could really light it up. And uh, so we're halfway done with our tree. But with that said, Christmas is coming. So I, I want you to understand something on your Sunday morning news. There's a place for you to sign up for our Christmas Spectacular. This year, we're doing something completely different. Uh, we're breaking all traditions, so please forgive us. We're going to try something new. We're going to try to reach our community in a completely different way, and we need your help. We're going to be creating a Christmas village, and in that village, we're going to be designing escape rooms. And in those escape rooms are going to be the story of Christ, and the people are going to go in and they're going to experience and have to answer questions to figure out how to get out in the process learning the gospel story about Jesus. It's so cool. And then at the end, we're going to be taking them in and sharing the gospel with them. And we need your help. I think, I don't know how many number of rooms I should know already that I've been in so many meetings, but I want to say there's 15 or 20 rooms we have to make. And it's so it's, so, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. I'm, I'm excited about it. So we're going to be doing something new. We need you to sign up and help us. We're going to be doing something really quickly. This week, we're going to be doing some test runs on the rooms and see how hard they are. We're going to be designing them. And so I'm excited to see if I can get out. <laughs> I want you to know I've gone to a escape room or two. I never get out. <laughs> I, I'm, I want the escape room where I can kick the door down when I can't take it anymore. I don't think those will be there, but anyway. But anyway, we'd love for you to sign up. We're excited about what's happening around here and our opportunity to reach our city with the gospel. Being creative and finding ways to get people to listen or observe or think about their eternity is a, is a big task. And I hope that you'll partner with us as we do that. 
Well, as you know as well, we are on our giving campaign. We are, did our 90-day challenge and see if God would bless you. And so I hope that you have been participating. I hope that you're excited about what God's doing with you. We've been hearing stories of people who have been blessed already in their giving. And so we just want to celebrate you and celebrate those who give. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for this church. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that each and every one of us have to be part of this community at this time in history. Lord, our part is to transform the world. Lord, our goal is to reach one family at a time, one person at a time with your love. May we do so in such a way that we transform those around us for generations and generations to come. Give us boldness, give us strength, and help us to prepare ourselves for what you have for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. truth and dare. We're coming to the end of this, this series. We're coming to the end of this sermon. We've been talking about so many different things when it comes to this story. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to be talking a little bit about this final, this final phase. And as we talked about last week, uh, Wesley was talking about this passage and these warnings of God, Jesus saying, listen, I've, I've shared all this with you. Now I'm going to give you some warnings. And there are three of them that happen here at the end, and I'm at the second one. And the warnings are pretty important. This idea of what, they, what, they, what the narrow road was, and now this idea of what, um, of what it's going to be to be a false teacher. So, so I want you just to think for a moment about one of your favorite movies. Have you ever... Are you, are you that are into mystery movies, like you get to the end and they like, like throw this really weird thing at you and you're like, ah. Oh. I didn't get that. How, I mean, everybody, I, I was, I have that happen all the time to me it, now at Christmas time. It's called uh, Christmas Hallmark movies. <laughs> and you know, there's just like this mystery, like how they end, right? <laughs> I, I'm joking because you see, as soon as it starts, you're like, yeah, that girl and that guy, it's going to happen in there, fall and Christmas, Christmas. But the other day I was watching one, actually just last night I was watching one, I, I told my wife, I said, eh. This, this part right here is going to come out at the end. You watch. She's like silent over there. I'm like, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. And what, what's interesting about these mysteries in life is that sometimes, uh, sometimes we're distracted. Sometimes we're like amazed. And other times we know exactly what's happening. But one of the movies, the, the movies that I hate the most are when at the end of the movie, the guy you thought that was good the entire time ends up being the bad guy. And then it ends and the credits come on and you're like, what? There's just, that's just wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Well, you know what's interesting? The idea kind of falls in this, this concept of how we view false prophets. What is a false prophet? What is it all about? If you have your Bible, let's read about it. The concept today is this, a message, our message, the message must match the messenger. The message must match the messenger. Let's read in verse 15, it says this. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Every healthy tree bears good fruit, but a diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Even every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he quotes himself again by saying, thus you will recognize them who false prophets by their fruits. Let's pray. Father, we thank you as we open your word and we look at this important warning that you give the church that you give your people about false prophets. 
Lord, I pray today that we will be inspired to know our Bible more. Father, I pray today that we'll be more diligent, more willing to stand for righteousness and what is right because we know the dangers of a false prophet. Give us wisdom in all we do in Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen. So who are these prophets? You know, when Jesus makes this claim, I mean, I think to myself, what is a prophet? I, I immediately go to the other side. What is a prophet? Don't forget false prophets. Let's not go there yet. What is a prophet? What was a prophet? Well, prophets were interesting people. They were inspired by God to re reveal God's purpose and his will. A lot of times they foretold the future. A lot of times they gave warnings. Sometimes they gave inspiration, but they were about showing the world who God was and what God wanted them to do. One chosen to speak on behalf of God and who did his will. In the Old Testament, they spoke of God and told future events that would to take place. But what, what's the story today? Today, a prophet is defined, listen, as this, as a person with the ability to speak forth the truth of God's word. Okay? Believers with this gift typically have a strong biblical perspective and the ability to actually accurately handle scripture. They are able to discern false doctrines and warn God's people about deception. Their desire is to promote obedience to the word and address heart issues that could lead people into sin. This is a modern day prophet. Since the gift of prophecy is so influential, listen, it is essential for those to have, who have it to be humble, and motivated by God's love and his people. Okay, I want you just to think about that short description. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 2 says this, Paul says this, and if I have a prophetic power and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I have nothing. You see, these prophets were to speak the truth in love about who God is and what God's will is for humanity. This is the idea of prophecy. Today's prophecy is a gift of the Spirit. It is not a gift of foretelling. I do not believe that prophets are adding any more scripture to the Bible today. I don't believe that there's a person who can say, God said this and it's not part of the Bible and this is what you should do. I, I would run from those people. I'm a little nervous about that. See, it is a gift of revealing and discerning the word of God to others in their time of need. There's no question that I have spoken to people and said, hey, this has been laid upon my heart. The Spirit has shared this with me and I would like to share it with you and it will be God's word. The person will say, hey, I really needed that. You didn't know, but I was going through this. Do you realize in the house today that that happens all the time? There are so many times that you have spoken to somebody, you have shared to somebody because God has laid on your heart to speak to them and before you know it, they're like, I needed that. Sometimes it's a word of warning. Other times it's a word of inspiration. But in all cases, it is 100% agreeing with the word of God. 100% agrees with the word of God. You must understand and know this is the idea of what it means to be a prophet today. So prophets proclaim the truth of God's word and the will of God in love. So what is a false prophet. You say, Pastor Ron, that's so easy. The opposite of that. I'm already falling asleep here. I'm exhausted. I've had a rough day. Well, let's just dive into what that really looks like. False prophet then is what? They're claiming to speak on behalf of God, but are not. They speak lies instead of truth. They can appear to be spiritual and loving, but have a heart of destruction and hatred for the truth. False prophets in the Old Testament spoke of political, for political reasons and personal reasons. When we talk about it, we're going to look at a false prophet in the Old Testament. It was about self-preservation. They wanted power. They wanted influence. They wanted approval amongst the people. They even wanted to save their own lives sometime. And so they would just say, God said this so I could live. Let me tell you something. The prophets in the Old Testament, many of them, when they said, God said this, guess what happened? They got killed or they got thrown in prison because they had to say the truth no matter what. False prophets aren't willing to do that. That's not their claim. Notice what Jeremiah the prophet says about false prophets. In Jeremiah 14, 4, he says this. Jeremiah saying, and the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them to speak to them. 
They are prophesying to you a lying vision, notice this, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. What are they saying? They're saying the own deception in their own mind, and that's what they're conveying to the people. <laughs> Verse 15 says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord, concerning the prophets, the false prophets, who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say, sword and famine shall not come upon this land. In other words, in this situation, the false prophets are saying, hey, we're all good. We're all good. God's, God's got our back. And, and God's like, nope. No, I want you to know something. You're not good. I'm sending judgment to Israel because of what you've done. And notice what he says, by the sword and by the famine, those prophets shall be consumed. You see, there's very interesting warning that Jesus makes here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He's warning teachers, not people necessarily. He's saying, listen, those who proclaim to speak on my behalf, I want you to know something. You will destroy yourself if you become a false prophet, if you teach what I have not sent you to say. Now, that was in the Old Testament. But what happened in the New Testament? Did Jesus see false prophets in his moment, in his day? Well, I truly believe he did, and he addresses it. Absolutely. Who were they? Well, they were the religious leaders of his time, proclaiming to be speaking on behalf of God, but they were liars, deceivers, and had no love in their hearts. The entire New Testament in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's constantly addressing these false prophets, these false priests saying, listen, you guys are, you guys are wolves. You guys are, are absolutely the enemy. Notice in Matthew 23 and verse 27, he says this. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Hey, all you guys that are proclaiming to speak from me, you're a bunch of liars. For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Whoa! How could somebody who pretending so much to be like Christ or, or wants to be this godly influence, how can they be such a wicked individual? So also you outwardly appear, and he makes it very poignant to them. So you also outwardly appear to be righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The false prophet, the pro false prophet is dangerous. So then the question we have to ask ourselves, whether they were Old Testament false prophets, and we had Jesus' day false prophets, what's happening today? Are there false prophets today? I mean, we don't really even talk about prophets, really. But, but are there false prophets today? Jesus said this. Who is Jesus? The, the ultimate prophet, priest, king, God most high. He speaks and says this in Matthew 24 and 24. He says this, for false Christs, who are false Christs? messiahs, saviors, people proclaiming that they know a different way to heaven or they know the way to heaven. And false prophets will arise and will perform what? How's that possible? They're going to perform great signs and wonders as to lead astray, if possible, even the very elect. This is important for us as Christians to understand. Christ followers must understand something. False prophets do some pretty amazing things. I'm not saying they're raising people from the dead. What I'm saying is they do some pretty amazing things. They do great things in the community. They make great impacts in people's lives. They do some what appears to be great and noble things. But in reality, their message is so far from Christ, it is a shame. They will look and speak as if they speak on behalf of God. They will use scriptures to promote their false agendas, just like Satan did in the garden. In other words, false prophets are great at using scripture to inspire or deceive a Christian or a believer or someone who's tending to want to desire to learn or to know into a lie. Does that happen today? These false prophets are not atheists. They're not world haters. I want you to understand that. Like, listen, like Wesley talked about last week, we're not talking about people who are not familiar with the church. We're talking about people that are very familiar with the church, that use spiritual influences to determine and to deceive people away. Their motives, listen, again, have not changed from the beginning. They desire their wickedness. They desire to steal God's glory. They are wolves seeking to destroy, and their father, they are about their father's business, Satan and Satan alone. Their desire is to destroy, 
because they are self-centered. They will sound so convincing that many will deceive, be deceived in the false gospels. So I asked myself this question, do we have a bunch of examples of that? And I was amazed to find that there were incredible examples throughout history, modern history, where examples of false prophets have come out. And we are so oblivious to this because they do such a great job of deceiving. But I even I thought back to back in the 70s, I think it was back in the 70s before my time, the, the whole movement where Jim Jones took a bunch of people down south and he got them all to commit suicide. It was crazy talk. It was ridiculous. And I thought to myself, who would be so deceived as to believe that is true? And yet hundreds of people died. So I started to do a little research and I, I ran across this story that was quite uh, upsetting. It was quite amazing, actually. And I, I thought to myself, is this the next level of false prophet? Is this what's really happening? And so I did a little homework and I, I found this might be true. I want to tell you a story and please don't be offended until I get to the end. <laughs> oh, boy. Reverend Justin Joplin. Young man of 12 decided that he was going to be in the ministry. Husband of three. He got his first job at Westover Baptist Church. It's the first Baptist church ever to be planted in Richmond, Virginia. Hmm. There he began a mission to revive an old dead church. Man, he saw that he had a mission. The church was dying. There was no one there. It was a huge facility. They had very few people. And so he did some amazing things. He opened the door to another church so that the two of them could partner in reaching the community and doing great things. He opened a school. He had more than 13 local partnerships to make the community a better place. Very noble, very noble things. However, in 2013, he was put on a commission on whether or not to accept or dis, dis, uh, disassociate with another church. And this other church had done something very interesting. They had hired their first gay pastor. Now you say, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Well, it's even worse than that because it was Park, uh, Jenner, Jenner Park, Jenner Park Baptist Church. Did you hear what I said? Baptist Church. And they had hired a homosexual and on his committee, they decided that they were going to allow that fellowship to continue. They were going to allow it. And so everybody at first was like, that's kind of odd. You know, I understand love. There's this big movement, but there's a really big red flag. I mean, this is a big time in history. I mean, how do we have love and inclusion and tolerance at the same time have truth and what the God's word says? The idea of loving everybody and not judging was viewed, by the way, by many as a good decision. But I'm afraid to tell you something there was a wolf in sheep's clothing. And it didn't seem right because it appeared very good. In other words, it seemed moral and ethical in, in, in humanity's eyes, which is we love everyone. But what does that mean to love everybody? The interesting part of his story was this. Justin, when he was 12, admired his grandfather. And his grandfather was a great man of God by the articles that I read. And his grandfather, however, had this situation where his wife had died. And because of that, he got remarried, which was totally legal and totally okay. But the church at that time would not recognize him and allow him to be a, a deacon in the church because they said, hey, it's a husband of one wife. And their interpretation of it basically created a tension of, hey, that just doesn't seem right. They Harry carried a tradition or a view that really hurt Justin's heart. He didn't like that idea, and so he truly wanted to make sure that that never happened again, and that's really why he, I believe, he voted the way he did. Let's fast forward. Five years later, Justin, he is running a church in Ontario, Canada. There he is, the pastor for five years. The message he preached was the pearl of great price. I want you to think about this. Two years ago, he's been the pastor for five years. He's on Zoom, and he presents an argument for the pearl of great price and how the pearl of great price is that we need to speak the truth, we need to proclaim the truth, and we need to live the truth, this pearl. When you listen to the message, you actually realize he takes the entire passage out of context, but he does something incredibly strange. In that sermon, 
He declares to all of his congregation that he has been living a lie. And because of the pearl of great price, he needs to tell the truth. And the lie is this, that he is actually a woman trapped in a man's body. And he has been pastoring for years. Years. He goes on to say how much that he loves the church, he loves people, he loves God. But that he wants to be called Julie from now on. Pastor Julie. Now, I don't know about you, but most people in a Baptist church probably went, wow, what has just happened? But it's not, doesn't end there. Story doesn't end there. You see, the deacon board got together and said that we got we to gotta address this and we, we, we can't have this. And so they had a church vote. So the church vote was this, do we keep Pastor Justin or do we not? Because we're not going to call him Julie. And guess what they voted? They voted to remove him. And everybody said, amen, that's wonderful. The problem with that story is this. The vote, 58 to 53. 58 to 53. 53 members in that church voted to keep that person who is obviously struggling and we need to love on and help, but clearly is not and should not be a pastor, someone sharing the word of God and truth with authority in a lifestyle that they're trying to accept. But not only that, listen to me, not only that, after the event, he was removed and many, listen to me, many American churches, Baptist churches invited Justin to tell his story so that they could work on their inclusion for the pastor. Church, what's happening? Church, what is happening? What is going on? What in the world are we talking about? Now, this is just one example. We could go down example after example, and I could go down other examples where pastors are all about greed and money and gambling, adultery, affairs. We could talk about any of them. The truth is this, we're a church who is doing some crazy things because we don't understand the danger of false prophets. We are disguised and deceived by love and tolerance or acceptance and good because we ourselves are living in such sin. And so how can we judge the pastor? He's, you know, he's just like me. Now listen, listen, listen. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says this. For the time is coming. If you have your Bible, I want you to highlight that. For the time is coming. I don't want you to say this. No, the time has come. The time is not coming. The time has come when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears, and they have accumulated for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and lusts. You want to know why 53 people voted that way? And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Now, do not understand me. I asked you to stay till the end of the story. Do not misunderstand me. I want you to grasp this. Our church and every church should love people who struggle with gender identity. Our church should love people who struggle with same-sex attraction. Our church should embrace and try to convince the way of God with the love of God to repentance. Every one of us knows we're all guilty. We all deserve hell. Everyone does. And we as believers should do so with love and compassion without question. That is our God, job. If you do not believe that, if you believe someone is so far gone, they're unreachable, I want you to know something. I'm glad that didn't happen to you. I'm glad somebody didn't say, oh man, that person is way too far gone. I can't love on them anymore. Praise God, nobody did that to me. And no one deserves that. However, however, we can never, listen to me, never promote sinful behavior as something approved by God. It is not. When I sin, it is not approved by God. No pastor can prophetically teach God's word and openly defile God's temple and his word. It cannot happen. I don't care if you're an adulterer, a drunkard. I don't care if you're homosexual, transgender. It doesn't matter what you are. 
You cannot openly, blatantly, in the face of God, claim one thing against his word and say, oh, thus says the Lord, hallelujah. That, my friend, is a false prophet, a false teacher, someone who is proclaiming to be righteous, proclaiming what is right, and is living and acting and doing and promoting something completely different. Now, the problem is, church, I believe we've fallen asleep because on the conservative side, we've said, oh, we don't want anything to do with them. Those are wicked people. And so what does the world brand us of? You're a bunch of haters. You guys are a bunch of haters. No hate. Hate, hate, hate. If you're on the other side, and you're like, oh, it's all about love. It's all about love. It's all about love. What do you do? You end up on this side saying everything is good. All your sin is great. Hallelujah. You're under the, you're under the blood. You're, you're under grace. You're good. And clearly, that's not what... Jesus is saying. He's saying, no, 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 there's something going on here. There's some story here that you need to pay attention. There's a warning sign I want you to pay attention to. False prophets will destroy your churches. They will destroy your heart. They will deceive your children and they will guide them away from who I am. I need to let you know and I want you to pay attention. Man, this is a serious, serious message. Paul says this, Paul says this because, again, this warning, like the last warning I preached on, was probably a little bit towards you. I want you to know this warning is towards me. I am preaching to myself, and I am letting you know that I want to be held accountable because every pastor, every pastor is responsible for what he speaks and how he speaks it and what he says and how he says it and how he lives his life afterwards. Notice this. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul speaking to Ephesus says this, pay careful attention to yourselves. He's talking to the elders of the church, the pastors, the leaders. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you, made you, chosen you to be overseers. Hmm. To be careful for the church of God which he ordained, listen to me, with his blood. We just celebrated communion as a commitment to a covenant that he made with us and we with him. This is why it is serious. This is a serious matter. When we mock, when we in, our, in God's face choose to defile him, blaspheme his name as a false prophet, we are in rough shape. Notice what he goes on to say, for I know that after my departure, this is Paul speaking, fierce wolves, who, who are wolves? We know false teachers will come among you, not sparing the flock. They don't care about the flock. They're going to deceive everyone that they can from among, notice this, that they'll be from among your own selves. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things and drawn away and draw, draw away the disciples after them. Did you, hear, did you hear that? Let's not be so angry with the assembly. Let's not be angry with the public school system. Let's not be concerned about that. that. We'll have time to be concerned about that. I want you to know in this realm, we have to be careful as individuals and as pastors and leaders that this doesn't happen. He's saying, listen, from within you, you are going to struggle. You're going to have these battles happen. There are going to be people coming to you, wanting to draw away the very disciples. Do you want to know what are the worst things that we can do as we prophesy, as we tell the truth, as we share the word of God with people? And what we do in our lives draws away one of these young people. I want you to know something. Jesus takes that very, 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 very seriously. And unfortunately, we have lived a laissez-faire of selfishness and a life of our own. And hey, God's good for everyone. And that's not exactly the way it plays out. So church, how in the world do we recognize a false prophet? I mean, what do we really do? How do we do it? How do I do it? How do the teachers do it? How should you do it? Because you also can be prophetic in your gift, discerner of the word of God. Are you willing to stand out? Notice this. It is a option. It's a choice. It's a warning and it's a dare. That's where we get the idea of truth and dare. The truth is there are false prophets. The dare is, will you call them out? The dare is, will you observe them? Will you pay attention? Will you protect your own, your church, 
your people, the flock. Notice in verse 16, he says this, you will recognize them by what? Their fruits. This is a tough one because a lot of us struggle. Are grapes gathered from bushels or from thorn bushes and figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. It seems so easy, but diseased tree, trees bear bad fruit. That seems obvious. Healthy trees cannot bear bad fruit or unhealthy tree or healthy, healthy trees cannot, cannot produce bad fruit and, 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 and diseased trees can't produce good fruit. He's like, hey, this seems obvious, but it's never that way, that quite that easy when Jesus is speaking. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you recognize them for the fruit. So seems obvious, right? We just got to pay attention to fruit. The problem is what? If we are so deceived in what we think is fruit and truth, we ourselves find ourselves completely deceived. I mean, think about these people that were in this church. They got deceived into believing something else was fruit, good works, niceness, kindness, acceptance, whatever. It doesn't matter what it was, but they were deceived. They were, they were caught off guard. They were not paying attention because they did not know what the true word of God said. Listen, Christians, be careful. I do not want you to come to this church because you may like my teaching style or you may like my personality or you may not like me. And that's why you come, just to make fun of me every day. <laughs> I'm letting you know something. Those are not reasons why you listen to someone sharing the word of God. It's not to because we're captivating. No, don't be swayed by promises of wealth and power. Don't be drawn away by those who disregard your sin and say it's no big deal. Don't pursue, listen, don't pursue one who promises eternal life without sacrifice and self-denial. I want you to listen to me. The gift of eternal life is free. Christ paid it all. There is no work we can do, but let me tell you something. It requires denial. The Bible says you gotta take up your cross and follow me. It's not just, hey, I prayed that prayer and I'm good to go and everything's awesome and I can live how I wanna live. That's not the Christian life. That's not what the Bible teaches. And so I hope that you understand the magnitude of that. So how do we inspect the fruit of a false prophet? I'm gonna go through some things I want you to write down. They're probably not gonna be on the board, but I want you to think about them. First thing is this. First thing is this. Pay attention to self-righteousness. That's what this whole thing is about. This entire series, this entire sermon, Jesus is constantly saying, hey, listen to me. You think that, but I'm telling you this, it's about the heart. Stop pretending. Don't pay attention to those who are self-righteous. A false prophet claims to live one way but lives another. Or he speaks one thing and lives out another. True prophets, listen to me. True prophets do not sidestep their own depravity. True prophets do not sidestep their own depravity. They do not say, I don't have this problem. I don't have this problem. Look at me. I'm so wonderful. I want you to know, I, I probably don't do that to a fault. I probably shouldn't say everything that I say up here, but I'm letting you know that I'm human. I sin daily and it is wrong. And I am working on it every day in my sanctification, in my pursuit of Christ. I want to improve myself because I love God. And sometimes I don't move as fast as you do. Sometimes I'm a, little, I'm a little more stubborn. I understand that. Some of you guys got it all figured out. I don't. And I want you to know that. False prophets are not self-righteous. They understand their own depravity. Think about this. The prophet Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. Notice what he says when he encounters God. This is a powerful statement. Chapter five, 6 and verse 5, it says this. This is Isaiah speaking as he is before the throne of God. He says, woe is me. Woe is me, for I am lost. Isaiah, the prophet, a man of God, faces God face to face and hits his knees and says, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Listen to me. If you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ and your life has been transformed by him and you constantly remind yourself of who he is and who you are not, you can't help but understand that you are not holy. You are righteous, set apart, forgiven, eternal, child of God, absolutely. But we are man. 
sinful man. And we are battling sinful habits. And you cannot face God and not believe that is true. The first sign of a false prophet, one who is self-righteous, who sees himself higher than he should. Another thing is this, pay attention to those manipulating the scripture to match a cultural narrative. They want to manipulate the scripture to match a cultural narrative. They want to fit in. They want to feel like they're making a difference. They want to, it's all about them. It's not about Christ. It's not about righteousness and truth. If you have a Bible, we're going to spend the next few minutes here in 2 Peter chapter 2. This entire chapter is about false prophets. It's important for you to understand it. Here we go. Chapter 2 and verse 1 says this, but false prophets also arose among the people. Just as there were, will be false teachers among you. Notice how he ties false prophets in the Old Testament to false teachers in the New Testament. He goes on to say this, who will secretly, listen to this, secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing up for themselves swift destruction. Do you think Justin Joplin came out the first day and said, hey, I'm a woman? No, he did not. 10, 15 years. He was in that. His mind was not right. He had not seen himself as the sinner he was and did not understand who God was in the battle he faced. No question it was a difficult battle. No question it's a battle that is hard for us to understand, but the bottom line is it's still the battle that he had to bear. But he, what did he do? He manipulated scripture to create a culture and change a, change, a, change a whole church. So when he came out and said so, 53 people agreed in what he had done. Church, we have to be very cautious about that. There are so many things attacking the church there are so many churches that are starting to change their narrative away from the gospel and away from the word world because of this. Destructive thoughts. The next one is this, pay attention to their lack of self-control. Pay attention to their lack of self-control. We're gonna go through these quickly. Second Peter 2, 2 says this, and many will follow their sensuality and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Notice because of them, because of them, the pastors, because of the pastor's way, because of their, their self-centeredness, their lack of self-control, the way of truth, the way of truth will be blasphemed. You want to know what happens when a false teacher ha speaks out and deceives people? They start saying that good is bad and bad is good. This is the world that we live in. This is why we should be warning ourselves and paying attention. 2 Peter 2, 3 says this, pay attention to their love of money. And their attention, for in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. They are, their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not sleeping. Listen, false teachers point their way. Their fruit is displayed by their love of money or their love of attention or it's about them. Pay attention to their lack of theological history. This is important for you to grasp. I know all of America has lost its concept of what history is. That's why we celebrate Veterans Day, because we never want to forget the sacrifice that they have done and the willingness that they have to serve. We want to celebrate that idea. But do you want to know something in the church? We have lost history. We have totally forgotten what has happened. Let's just walk through how Acts, our first, second Peter talks about this. First, history tells us what? The spirit of rebellion destroys our relationship with God. How does he display that in this passage? Second Peter 2, 4 says this, for if God did not separate the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of a gloomy darkness, but kept and to keep them until the day of judgment. Listen, I want you to know your history. In heaven, there was a battle between Satan and God, and God threw out Satan and the angels. Why? Because of their pride and arrogance and false truth. They were false prophets. How about this? The spirit of violence doing right in our own eyes destroys us. He goes on to say, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah for heralding of righteousness with seven others when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Church, pay attention to your history. God destroyed the entire humanity because they turned their back on God minus one righteous man in humanity. Can you imagine? Can you imagine today it coming down to you? You're the one righteous man. If that was history, that's overwhelming to think about. Know it. 
How about history? The spirit of unnatural behaviors brings judgment. Don't forget history. Where does he go in this passage? Peter go? He goes right here. Verse 6. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. Pay attention to your history. Know what the danger of a false prophet and notice the topics that he chose. Rebellion to God, doing things right in your own eyes. And then he goes on to perversion and says, these things right here are destroying my people. Verse seven says this, this, however, if he re rescued Lot, greatly distressed by, his, by the sensual conduct of the wicked. For as that righteous man Lot lived among them day after day, he was tormented, he was tor tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds. And he saw that he saw in Herald. If then is, that is true that he saved Lot, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Church, listen to me. Lot is described as being tormented by the influence of those around him. They, he, they, he was frustrated. He was dealing with it. And yet he stayed faithful and he stayed true. Notice verse 10, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passions and despise authority. Whose authority? God's authority. What, or where are we living? What is the sign of the salt false prophets that are coming our way? They're living sensual, greedy, materialistic lives. And we're seeing that throughout our country. And we have to make sure that we warn ourselves, that we protect ourselves and that we pay attention. Church, I want you to know something. As we close, False prophets are real. And I believe we as a church and we as pastors have had our head in the sand. We have chosen to ignore the truth. We don't want to get in a fight because we're always painted as a bad person because we don't know how to do it in love. I believe there are so many members in this church who are afraid to confront sin in righteousness because they just don't want to be branded. But I'm here to tell you something. The true prophet, the one who speaks on behalf of God, whether they're in a podium or whether they're in the workplace, does so without fear or compromise. Cannot change his faith or what he believes or where he's going. He has to. He has to. He has to stand for what is true, for what is right, what is holy. We have to be a people who do not have fear, but we have boldness to stand for what is true. Church, I pray that that will be our church. I pray that you will hold me accountable and every one of the pastors that work here at this church that you employ. I pray for you that you will decide and determine that you will know the word of God in such a way that you will not be deceived by false teachers because we have a lot of work to do because we have a lot of deception that is happening. We're in a new world. The time is not coming. The time is not coming. The time has come. I hope that you understand that. We're not living in a Christian nation much anymore. We're in a post-Christian nation because we have allowed wickedness into our public schools. And our churches have flat out let the ball drop. We have let it drop. And so I ask you today, I ask you today, will you be one who knows the word, who proclaims the truth, who is not afraid of what God's word really says? Will you deny the truth that is in it to make yourself feel good or to promote yourself? I hope not. Because just so you know, that's not the faith that transforms the world. Let me say that again. That's not the faith that transforms the world. If we're going to make a big deal about following Jesus, then we're going to make a big deal about what Jesus says it means to be a follower. If we're going to make a big deal about Jesus, 
We're not going to stand up here on the podium and say what everybody needs to, wants to hear because they have tickling, itching ears because they don't want to be offended. It's not going to happen. Listen, we're going to be a church that makes a difference, that shows that God's word transforms the very soul of who we are from wickedness to follower. Amen? Church, I'm so excited that this place is a place of followers, those who desire to know God and serve him, submit to him, and be world changers. Because if we do so, we will see the power of God like none other. But if we choose to follow our own itching ears, we will give up our power. And as a matter of fact, God will be against us, not for us. And if God is against us, we're in trouble. COVID's not against us. The government's not against us. We don't want God against us. We want to stand for what's righteous and we don't want to be false prophets in the way we communicate his truth to the world. I hope and pray that you with me. But if you're here today and I offended you, I said something you didn't like, I just want you to know I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I didn't use my words well, but ultimately I want you to understand something. I'm only sorry because I'm not being able to convey the true love that Jesus Christ has for you. I want you to know something. If you're in the house today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never given your life to him. I want you to know that he's worthy. He's worthy. When I fail, he's more worthy than me. He is a holy and righteous God who loves you with all of his heart. He did so much that he sent his son to this world to die for your sin and for mine so that you could be in a relationship with him. You could be forgiven, transformed by his word. You can live a life of peace. You can still struggle. You'll be still struggling in your sin, I'm sure, just like me. But you've been forgiven. You've been given a mission. You've been given a way out. And I pray today that during prayer time in just a minute, you'll give your life to Jesus because he's the only answer I'm not the answer. The worship team is not the answer. The person next to you is not the answer. Your husband, your wife is not the answer. Your mom's not the answer. There's one answer for that big hole in your heart. And it's Jesus. He's the only perfect son of God. And he loves you. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me today, I wanna to encourage you to reach out to us. We would love to pray for you when we would love to encourage you and give you some information now that you're saved. Listen, you can do so by emailing us at info at abt.church and a pastor will contact you and reach out to you. Listen, if you'd like to have more information about our church, please go to abt.church. You'll see all that we're doing around here, all the things that you can get involved with, that your kids can get involved with. We want to build a community where you can be known and you can be loved here at the Anchorage Baptist Temple. Well, we're so glad that you joined us this week. We hope that you'll join us next week by television or by the internet or even in our auditorium. We would love to invite you here. May you have a great week. God bless.